Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I am finally in possession of my copy of Ignition, An Informal History of Liquid Rocket Propellants by John D. Clarke, a book written in 1972, just before I was born. But uh, its reputation amongst fans of rockets is a uh, somewhat special. It is a basically a book on chemistry, or the chemistry of rocket fuels. It covers a uh, you know, post-war period up to the early, late 60s. And it is written in a very amusing style, very, uh, a lot of jokes and stuff. It's kind of a bit like Hunter S. Thompson, but with a different, completely different kind of chemistry. This book was out of print for a really long time, during which it wasn't uncommon to see copies selling for hundreds of dollars. But in the meantime, its stature has grown and many people have wanted a reprint and finally Rutgers University has reprinted this so I can pick up my copy. I got this from Barnes & Noble because Amazon was sold out. <laughs> they weren't going to be able to ship new ones until late June, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to see that people are really buying it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I've previously talked about the chemistry of rocket fuel. Most recently, I actually talked about the fuel that Von Braun used in the V2, ethanol. A rocket fuel that wasn't just safe enough to drink, but that the powers that be went to great lengths to try and stop people from drinking it because it was basically very strong vodka. Now, but if you look inside the pages of this book, you're going to hear about some vastly more toxic rocket fuels. I mean, we've talked in the past about hydrazine and the, the various derivatives of that we've used today. That, you know, hits the human nervous system, not to mention being carcinogenic and uh, highly corrosive. Uh, Hydrazine-based fuels are ubiquitous in reaction control systems where you need storable propellants for a long period of time, and they're still used in the first stage boosters of some Russian and Chinese launch vehicles. Uh, the combination of unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and uh, nitric acid was nicknamed by the Soviets as the Devil's Venom, and this was the fuel that was used in the R-16 ICBM, which famously, or less famously, exploded during testing, killing many of the engineers and Chief Marshal Nedelin, known as the Nedelin disaster. But for all its toxicity, hydrazine is still in use because uh, its drawbacks are tolerated, but there have been other fuels with many more extreme properties that have been investigated, only to be carefully set aside because the advantages weren't quite as promising or the drawbacks were just too big. For example, the author talks about ozone. Now, ozone is a molecule which is made of oxygen atoms. Now, the garden variety oxygen that we breathe and need to survive has two oxygen atoms, but ozone has a third. So you get 50% more oxygen, right? Well, actually, it's even better than that. The density is almost double that of regular liquid oxygen when you have liquid ozone. But that third o oxygen atom makes the molecule kind of unstable. It really wants to get out of there and releases energy in the process. So these monatomic oxygen atoms coming off, those are desperate to bind to anything. If you happen to be a biological organism nearby, it's quite likely that that oxygen atom will come off and uh, bind to some inconvenient part of your, your cellular biology and cause all sorts of problems. That's why liquid, well, that's why ozone is used in some you know, sterilization and purification systems because it's actually really toxic at a cellular level. It's also unstable, as I've mentioned, and it has a propensity for exploding if you have pure liquid ozone. Since the pure ozone was so uh, lethal, experimenters would use mixtures of liquid ozone and uh, oxygen in a 3 to 1 oxygen to ozone ratio. But even then, after they successfully ran their engines, they would later find out, uh, or they would find the engines would explode after they were shut down. But the author ends the section on cryogenics with a, a nice little word about ozone and its potential future prospects back in 1972. For ozone still explodes. Some investigators believe that the explosions are initiated by traces of organic peroxides in the stuff, which come from traces of oil the oxygen was made of. Other workers are convinced that it's just the nature of ozone to explode, and still others are sure that original sin has something to do with it. So although ozone research has been continuing in a desultory fashion, there are very few true believers left who are still convinced that ozone will someday somehow come into its own. I'm not one of them. 
The same chapter on cryogenics also talks about liquid fluorine, which is a stronger, more energetic oxidizer than liquid oxygen. Pairing hydrogen with fluorine instead of oxygen results in a boost in performance, but it also results in an exhaust of hydrofluoric acid, which is nasty stuff. Both the oxidizer and the exhaust are horribly toxic. There's no way a booster would ever be fueled this way, but there is a niche for upper stages where the rocket is far enough downrange that the exhausts would be well enough dispersed before returning to Earth. But I don't see that happening. Hydrofluoric acid poisoning is nasty because the hydrofluoric acid gets absorbed through your skin and once inside it starts looking for calcium ions and it pulls it out of your bones or in various other chemicals that are perhaps used for nerve signaling. Uh, the way you treat it is by overdosing the person with huge amounts of calcium and people have been known to survive just fine, but it is not nice. Um, but anyway, yeah, if liquid fluorine wasn't reactive enough, how about you try to put even more fluorine into the system? Chlorine trifluoride, where there are three fluorine atoms that have been persuaded to huddle around a single chlorine atom. And they're just ready to get out of there and react with something else. As an aside, lots of these adventures in fluorine chemistry were in fact a byproduct of the Manhattan Project, which of course used things like uranium hexafluoride in fuel enrichment. I'll let the author explain just how potent chlorine trifluoride is. It is of course extremely toxic, but that's the least of the problem. It is hypergolic with every known fuel and so rapidly hypergolic that no ignition delay has ever been measured. It is also hypergolic with such things as cloth, wood and test engineers, not to mention asbestos, sand and water, with which it reacts explosively. It can be kept in some of the ordinary structural metals, steel, copper, aluminum, etc., because of the formation of a thin film of all insoluble metal fluoride, which protects the bulk of the metal, just as the invisible coat of al oxide on aluminum keeps it from burning up in the atmosphere. If, however, this coat is melted or scrubbed off and has no chance to reform, the operator is confronted with the problem of coping with a metal fluorine fire. For dealing with this situation, I've always recommended a good pair of running shoes. The truth is, it was just too corrosive, making the engineering problems of utilising it safely the real barrier to actual use. Incidentally, the highest specific impulse ever obtained from a chemical rocket engine was a lithium fluorine hydrogen engine. The tri-propellant design required cryogenic storage of the fluorine and the hydrogen, while the lithium had to be heated to keep it liquid. All this engineering effort yielded a specific impulse of 542 seconds, which was a significant improvement over the 450 seconds that you get from the Space Shuttle's main engines. The pursuit of performance wasn't always about specific impulse though. Hydrogen's high performance is offset by low density and in many military applications the density is more desirable. One section on the pursuit of higher densities discusses the use of mercury in rocket fuels. The first suggestion was dimethyl mercury, a substance whose toxicity is legendary. It famously killed a scientist researching the stuff after a drop of it was absorbed through her latex gloves and then through her skin. So yeah, chapter 12 in the book talks about mercury in rocket fuels. I looked this stuff up and discovered that indeed the synthesis was easy but that it was extremely toxic and a long way from harmless. As I had suffered from mercury poisoning on two previous occasions and didn't care to take a chance doing it again, I thought that it would be an excellent idea to have somebody else make the compound for me. So I phoned Rochester and asked my contact man at Eastman Kodak if they would make 100 pounds of dimethyl mercury and ship it to me. I heard a horrified gasp and then a tightly controlled voice. I could hear the grinding of teeth behind the words, inform me that if they were silly enough to synthesize that much dimethyl mercury, they would in the process fog every square inch of photographic film in Rochester, and that, thank you just the same, Eastman was not interested. The receiver came down with a crash, and I sat back to consider the matter. An agonizing reappraisal seemed to be indicated. So indeed, a reappraisal was indicated. That wouldn't be the end of the project. Instead, the author proposed injecting regular mercury into a combustion chamber of another rocket, fully expecting that such a crazy plan would be rejected. Instead, they were given the go-ahead. 
And uh, they actually started building a whole complex test setup with a scrubbing system to make sure that the mercury would be removed. But uh, their project was shut down and the, it was moved to a different lab, who then successfully tested this out in the middle of the desert, hopefully not poisoning anything worse than rattlesnakes. Thankfully, injecting mercury into rocket exhausts never went anywhere beyond this test. Anyway, the book is amazing and I highly recommend it to anyone that's interested in rockets, chemistry, or is just interested in a fun book on science. The title is Ignition, An Informal History of Liquid Rocket Propellant by John D. Clarke. It has a foreword by Isaac Asimov as well. But yeah, it's, it's fun. It's uh, also in demand. So be aware that if you order it right now, it might take a little longer than usual to get there. But yeah, so glad they reprinted this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.